Okay, so I'm going to get started uh, as those are uh, streaming in really lovely to have such a diverse group uh, with us today. My name is Cheryl Chung. I'm the Program Director of Exec Ex Executive Education Singapore Futures at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And earlier this year, we launched our new webinar series, Futures Forward, uh, where we're really hoping to be able to discuss public policy applications or futures thinking across a very wide range of topics. So I'm so excited to see this really wonderful international thriving community of thinkers, practitioners, uh, you know, and we hope that this is an opportunity to put your ideas out into the world. And, and I'm so glad to welcome you as part of this conversation today. Um, so for the first episode, we heard uh, from Liana, Suzanne and Julisha about uh, futures in public policy in Asia, and you can view that recording of that conversation online. But for the second episode, we're looking at the topic of developing futures capability, capacity in the public service. Um, and there's also this related question of not just developing futures capacity, but also developing capacity for the future. Sounds like a bit of a wordplay, uh, you know, but you know, I, I do wonder, you know, how do we develop that anticipatory capacity within government, but also how do you use that anticipatory capacity to build new skills and capabilities for, uh, you know, for future government jobs that may not even exist yet, right? So that's uh, something that I really love to uh, talk a little bit about today in this conversation. So to weigh in on this topic, we have three distinguished panelists. So excited to uh, welcome them uh, today. So uh, first, we have, uh, just to introduce, first of all, we have uh, Eva uh, Aminuddin, the head of the Learning Futures Group at the Civil Service College in Singapore. Uh, and then second, we have Ora On Putra Rowan, uh, the director of the School of Public Policy at Chiang Mai University, Thailand. Uh, and then Sherman Cruz, who wears many hats, but for the purpose of this introduction, the director and chief futurist at the Center for Engaged Foresight based in the Philippines. Uh, so before we begin, maybe a few housekeeping points. Um, you know, for the first half of the session, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit, we'll talk a little bit amongst ourselves, uh, you know, to give a bit of an induction and a context on this topic of uh, developing futures, uh, capacity and capabilities for the public service. And in the second half, I'd really like to open it up uh, for questions. So I do encourage you to think about the questions, uh, you know, and kind of keep them coming uh, through the Q&A function that you'll see uh, on the webinar, uh, the Zoom webinar uh, link. So please, uh, if you can, state your name and organization as well as your question. Uh, so it will also helps to give our panelists a little bit of context uh, as to where you're coming from and, and the questions that you ask. So if everything's okay, everybody's good, and I still see people uh, telling us where they're from, Malaysia, Cambodia, Pakistan, I love it. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Um, so if everybody's okay, let's get started, uh, you know, and uh, really starting with a longtime colleague uh, and friend, Eva. Uh, so delighted to have you together with us today, Eva. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, Eva is the head of the Learning Futures Group. I think that's such a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, interesting title um, at the Civil Service College here in Singapore. Uh, and we work together in the Public Service Division almost a decade ago now. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a few Wow, ago, right? yeah. Um, and, you know, since the public service division in Singapore serves a bit like uh, whole of government HR, right? You know, I think this question of futures capacity and, and capacities for the future is always top of mind, right? How do you try to uh, anticipate what is needed and how to kind of transform the public service to be, you know, ready for future challenges, that kind of thing. So I'm really curious as a, as a starting point, if you can maybe share a little bit about yourself as well as what the futures capacity look in the public service looks like to you, that'd be great. Okay, thanks Cheryl. Uh, thanks again for the invitation, really excited to be here with everybody. So I'm uh, Eva Aminuddin, and actually I recently only, uh, you know, beginning of this year only started uh, this role of uh, head of the Learning Futures Group at the Civil Service College uh, or CSC for short. And for those of you, our international friends who are a bit unfamiliar with uh, uh, Singapore, the CSC, we're a statutory board under the Public Service Division of the Prime Minister's Office. 
We're basically the learning and development arm of the public service and our mission is really to build a first class public service. And so we're dedicated to not just enhancing the public service, innovating with technology, but also equipping uh, the public service to be future ready. So that's in our mission and uh, is a core, uh, you know, uh, mission for us as an organization. Now, while I'm new to the role at Learning Futures Group, I'm actually not new to the public service, uh, nor am I new to the uh, futures work. In fact, I was reflecting uh, my first experience, I was just sharing with Cheryl in futures work was actually as an undergraduate uh, intern at the Ministry of Manpower while I was doing my degree in political science. Um, and this was in the year 2000, that reveals a little bit my age. Uh, and it was a project on scenario planning on the future of work and manpower and labor implications. Um, a topic that I think is top of mind for many of us now as we grapple with the possibilities of a post-pandemic world, AI, data-driven working world, right? So that was just a really good, interesting reflection. Uh, so I remember learning about scenario planning uh, as an intern, um, also uh, attending meetings with the scenario planning office uh, then, uh, that, uh, that is now actually uh, transformed into the Center for Strategic Futures in Singapore. Uh, I previously, it was, uh, you know, our focus was a lot more on scenario planning as a key uh, futures tool uh, in, the, in our toolkit uh, in the Singapore government. Um, I also then uh, later started out uh, some of the early work in policy gaming, which is a key tool for Singapore's uh, foresight capabilities. Uh, so I've been doing futures work on and off. I don't profess to be an expert. I'm still learning and exploring this topic, I think as most future practitioners will say, um, and really excited to be discussing this with you. Now I shared my um, undergrad, undergrad uh, memory because uh, I think uh, just a good reflection of how much has changed in terms of Singapore's public service futures capability. Um, actually, today, many of our public sector agencies and departments have developed their own in-house futures capabilities. At the Centre of Government, we have the Centre for Strategic Futures that focuses on, you know, whole of government strategic planning and prioritisation, coordination and development around futures uh, work and efforts. There's also an extensive effort that CSF uh, drives in terms of developing uh, and nurturing the futures community, incubating and analysing new capabilities. So I mentioned that we started off, I think, with scenario planning as one of our key tools. Like over the years, um, we've expanded that toolkit uh, and now look at causal layer analysis, backcasting, and even policy gaming. Um, and I think that speaks volumes to how much uh, the work has grown over the years. So CSC's role in terms of uh, developing futures capability, we basically work very closely and support the Center for Strategic Futures Capability Development Agenda. That includes workshops targeted at different levels of government to impart basic to more advanced uh, tools and skills relevant to government foresight work. Uh, we also work with CSF, uh, the Center for Strategic Futures, to expose our leadership pipeline to the foresight tools through our leadership milestone programs. So if you think about futures work, even for me as an undergraduate doing that project, actually that there is a very strong effort and increasingly growing effort to build that vocabulary, awareness and understanding across the public service. But one of the foresight capabilities that I thought I'd like to discuss a bit more today is the development of participatory foresight capabilities. So participatory foresight activity, such a mouthful, uh, is not just about involving key stakeholders, but also citizens, right? And these activities has really increased manifold over the last uh, decade in Singapore. So I think Cheryl was part of this effort in 2012 to 2013, when we had the first hour Singapore conversations, which involved 47,000 Singaporeans who participated in over 660 dialogues about the future. In 2015, there was the Future of Us exhibition, a national ad exhibition that involves citizen engagement in the design of the exhibition that showcased the possibilities for Singapore's future. And there was also follow-up citizen engagement regarding the future during that uh, exhibition called The Future of Us. Most recently during the pandemic, I think all the Singaporeans would be familiar with this, there, there is the emerging stronger conversations that are actually currently ongoing that uh, started last year 
has involved close to 19,000 Singaporeans reflecting on what we have learned from our shared experience of this pandemic and how it is shaping the future that we wish to build for our nation. So in the public sector, the recognition of the limits of expert foresight is growing alongside the efforts by government to harness the collective capacity of our society to create a greater public value. These participatory foresight activities, you know, they give us futurists more ideas to work with. It's also a great way to alleviate our own biases, uh, question our own adherence to, uh, you know, uh, simplistic metrics or ideology. So I think, I think it's a great uh, uh, it's a great development. We, so we've had three major participatory foresight activities at the national level over the span of 10 years. And uh, I'm speaking about myself, uh, I foresee that you know, we can expect more going forward. And as you can imagine, these activities are very resource intensive, requires a solid base of capable public officers and partners across the public service and sometimes outside of the public service to have core skills uh, and competencies such as facilitation, engagement design, even like active listening, working across boundaries, sense making all necessary skills, not only to design authentic engagement sessions, but also to capture the details, nuances shared during these activities that can be channeled to core groups of uh, futurists, skilled futurists across the public service. And, and as you can think about it, these core competencies, they don't just serve futures work, but other core functions of the public service, such as public engagement, you know, especially as these uh, engagement exercises um, uh, become more and more of a norm in governance. So I think a focus for us going forward is the de development of these co core competencies that strengthen the core or a base of our public service in a way that helps feed and uh, helps uh, facilitate the work that for uh, futurists like us do. My last point, and I, I'll end off, uh, is that improving participatory foresight also requires strengthening our citizens' capacity, right, to consider other aspects of the future besides uh, the changes they want to see. These aspects, including sensing emerging issues, identifying drivers of change, charting path uh, forward, you know, amidst tensions and trade trade-offs and imagining the possible, not just the desired scenarios for the future. So I've been part of all uh, three major participatory foresight activities uh, in different capacities, most recently as a facilitator for the Emerging Stronger Conversations. And I think one of the things that we've realized, we've talked about strengthening the citizen um, understanding uh, of foresight work, which I think we're also doing through education. So if you go back to my first example, as an undergrad, I was already exposed to scenario planning many years ago. And I think that uh, since my time, there's actually been more of the language of futures and the importance of it that has penetrated into the education system and into our society. And as we conduct more and more of these uh, engagement exercises, I'm also noticing that the understanding of the work, the value of the work and how citizens can contribute to the work in a way that actually derives uh, a, a, you know, potential great value for the nation as a whole uh, is increasing and growing as, at the same time. So I think the question for, for us going forward in Singapore is thinking about how do we augment this, support it uh, so that you know, we can harness the, the potential for this in, in a really meaningful way. Yeah, so uh, I thought I wanted to share that uh, with you because I think the Emerging Stronger Conversations is something that's really present. Um, I think there's so much to learn from the pandemic um, and our shared experience, right? Not just as a, in Singapore, but across the world about what we're learning, um, what are some of the emerging forces that we need to pay attention to as futurists. So I think I'll end there. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from the other speakers and the conversation to follow. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eva. Um, I really enjoy what you said about participatory foresight. We had, uh, we've been running a futures masterclass uh, here at the Lee Kuan Yew School. And that was one of the questions uh, that came up uh, yesterday, you know, about kind of the limits to the elite foresight model, right, and the more kind of expert, top-down, uh, you know, and, and I think one question that we always have is who owns, who owns the future, right, and, and who gets to decide what the future looks like, uh, you know, and, and the ability to make that an inclusive conversation, I think it's very, uh, is, is such an interesting 
uh, growing capacity, you know, and it's so important for civil services all over the world as well. But thank you so much for sharing. Really appreciate that. Great. <clears throat> Maybe at this point, we can move on to Aura. Uh, so Aura is the director of uh, <clears throat> the School of Public Policy at Chiang Mai University in Thailand. And I really miss being in Thailand. <laughs> uh, I, I remember my first time there was actually in a futures workshop with uh, you and some of your colleagues and partners. Uh, yes. And of course, I'm very biased as a futures evangelist, uh, but I think the um, you know futures is not a sil silver bullet, right? And I think what I really appreciate about your approach at Chiang Mai is really that integration of different skills for the future. Um, so can I pose this question to you as well? Okay. You know? um, okay. Thank you very much. What does capacity look like for you? Thank you very much, Cheryl. And um, yes, thank you for having me here and uh, being part of this wonderful panel. And hi to uh, the audience. Um, I, I completely agree with um, Eva, you know, the points about futures thinking, about the ability to anticipate, to be future ready, uh, to share my own views on this, uh, to give a bit more background about myself, I to be open, right? I used to be part uh, of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and lived in Singapore for eight years, uh, married to a Singaporean, still married to a Singaporean, <laughs> inshallah. Um, uh, I, I learned a lot from the Singapore's perspective of foresight and how the culture and the society as a whole, and particularly the government, look to the future and always anticipating the future. And I think it's a, a, a capability that is much needed in other countries, especially in, in my own, which is in Thailand. Uh, I'd like to add that um, as throughout the years, uh, looking at this sort of movement, um, I am part of SIPA, which is the Committee of Experts for Public Administration. Uh, we have a role to provide advice on public administration and public policy to ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. So we meet uh, regularly, annually, once a year in New York, or now with COVID, it's online. And we produce papers to advise um, the United Nations and member states, of course, on uh, the future and uh, the needed new capabilities. And, and I wrote in there about um, uh, being futures, think, futures thinkers, okay? Or, or fu have, have futures thinking in their way of, of working for public servants that is much needed. Um, I wanted to add that in addition to that though, we, we would like to look at futures thinking uh, in very much aligned with critical thinking. So it goes to, you know, you know, Eva also touched upon this, which is to actually allow for the deliberative process that happens during the foresight discussions to question existing structures, beliefs, uh, belief systems, to have critical lens, you know, to, to challenge even mainstream narratives about uh, many things that, uh, that govern us. And I think this is one of the key issues that um, is much needed, uh, you know, for, for I, I call it a creating safe space, safe space to talk about something so unfamiliar and so scary, right? Uh, and being part of this, uh, I add in as well, uh, EQ, emotional intelligence, to the whole trend of foresight and future thinking. Without truly knowing how we ourselves feel, then we're not able to not only not articulate our views, but also empathize with other people's views through acknowledging fears, the helplessness, the hopelessness, or the feeling of not knowing, you know, that, that fear of uncertainty through, through different, uh, about different things, whether it's about work, about education, about how we live, how we travel, about the economy, all kinds of things that uh, uncertainty brings. And this is, again, I, I want to just emphasize that um, emotions, emotional intelligence, all feeds into helping us futurists become more holistic, you know. Um, and this, at our school, at the School of Public Policy, we weave all of this in into design thinking as well by, by, picture, by, by picturing design thinking process as more of an immediate design of services or policies 
that we can uh, see or observe in the next two or three years. But that part of the design thinking, which actually takes in different views and then converges things, uh, we, we take that further into the futures thinking, which is you know, five years and beyond, 10 years and 20 years. So it's not convergence of ideas, but it's a divergence, right? Allowing all the di diversity of views to come up and be on the table. So that's how we link up design thinking with future thinking. All in all, all of it has to go through this emo uh, the motion of allowing our emotions to flow uh, in, in the entire process. So um, for us, we're, we're working closely with the Thai government, especially the National Innovation Agency, where um, they are also, they have been laying the foundation actually for futures thinking in the last decade for Thailand. And right now uh, we're training the trainers and we have uh, several projects of um, doing foresight for city level, especially smaller cities, secondary cities of Thailand. This will help push for the further decentralization and further, um, uh, uh, I would say, helping to um, readjust or rebalance the centralized nature of the Thai state uh, because Bangkok is a mega city and inequality numbers are, are not too good or not good at all in Thailand. Inequality is very high. So working with secondary cities is, is one effort to, to rebalance the centralized nature of the Thai state. And also looking at um, higher education. We've worked with the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Research Innovation as well to look at the future of higher education. Uh, we worked with the Ministry of Energy to look at the future of energy by going down to the very local levels of consumers and prosumers, uh, those who produce and those who consume at the same time for solar panels, for instance. How do you break the monopoly of the Thai state for, for energy production and, and the sale of energy to, to have more decentralized energy in Thailand, de democratization of energy, that's, that's the term. And then of course, uh, we, we've been working with um, cities as well to help the cities uh, go, going forward directly and also training the trainers as, as mentioned. So all in all, I think uh, futures work is so exciting for me because it allows us to look at how do we influence the discourse even, you know, the narratives, the discourse uh, for not only the country, but as mentioned, I, I look at the United Nations as, uh, at the level of the United Nations as well. And there we talk about the future of public sector workforce. And here we're actually looking into, you know, from all this work from home, it's, it's not happening only in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, or Singapore, it's happening in Ghana, Kenya, uh, Mongolia, you know, all kinds of places. And how will this actually reshape and, and redefine the relationship between civil servants, the government, the work, you know, what about the contracts, you know, what about benefits of a civil servant? What about um, workspace? How will all this play out in, in, in the longer term of this idea of work from home, you know? And France, for example, is coming up with new um, benefits and protection for their civil servants for modalities of work from home. And these are all the things that are so exciting around the world and also uh, in Thailand. So perhaps I'll start there. Great, thanks so much, Aura. I have a quick follow-up question just uh, for a selfish vested interest because I also come from a university. <laughs> but what do you see as the role of the higher education sector or, and specifically a public policy school, right? Um, yeah, no, definitely. This would I think, be maybe a civil service college or a, another type of organization. Yeah, I think um, because we're not part of government per se, right? I think we have more room to work on issues that might be um, difficult for government to work on. And uh, so for ourselves, uh, I think higher education can work as government consultants to lead this process, to bring in you know, like in Thailand, there's a future of politics. Oh, that's a very, very you know, difficult issue. The future of military, the future of monarchy, for instance. These are, I think, would be the role of higher education institutes to do. And um, for, for higher ed, in terms of our university, uh, Chiang Mai University has embraced this process wholeheartedly. So I led uh, 150 people 
of Chiang Mai University to do scenario planning. We came up with 106 uh, driving forces and distinguish between important and, and, and uncertain, certain, everything. And then came up with uh, so many different scenarios uh, in metaphorically as well. So all these things, I think uh, higher education institutes can play a role in introducing the concept and the process, using it themselves and then using it for other areas that would uh, help shape the, the fields, right? For example, the agriculture, we're, we're working also in looking at the future of young farmers, future of agriculture in Thailand, for instance, and that would feed right into how we train um, uh, students from the Faculty of Agriculture, for instance. So this would be my short answer to your question. Thanks, Cheryl. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, maybe it's a good time to move on to Sherman. So Sherman um, is the director and chief futurist for the Center for Engaged Foresight based in, in Manila. Uh, but actually you wear many hats uh, and maybe there are two that would be interesting to focus on for today. So uh, one hat that you wear is as the chair of the Association for Professional Futurists. Uh, and then the other one is as co-founder of the Philippines uh, Futures Thinking Society, which is such an interesting and, and exciting project as well. So um, pose the same question to you. How do you see uh, you know, developing futures capacity in the public service looks like? And I'm curious as to some of the similarities and differences based on the different hats that you wear. You could share, that'd be wonderful. Yes, uh, over several years of uh, foresight practice, you know, I've learned uh, four things. Uh, and then of course, uh, I, I think I need to provide a bit of a background to that. You know, uh, you know, I've been doing futures and foresight work uh, for more than a decade now. It's like 12 to 15 years and plus three, you know, as a scholar way back in 1997, 1998, I started learning about foresight. And then when I set up the Center for Engaged Foresight as a consulting hub, you know, based in Manila that uh, have operated, you know, uh, globally, and uh, of course, I did foresight workshops from farmer communities to, to women, uh, uh, to indigenous communities, to high level uh, engagement at the UN uh, institutional state level, regional, among others. And uh, with the diversity of experience and learning that I had, four things uh, came about. One is, uh, of course, uh, foresight has to be evidence based, right? Uh, it has to be data driven. You know, if you talk to you know, policymakers, uh, if you talk to scientists, you know, if you talk to people who are informed by a quantitative uh, approach, especially uh, those who have a strong background in research, it has to be evidence based, right? But then, of course, it runs contrary to you know, some <laughs> ideas and futures thinking and foresight that, uh, you know, uh, as Jim Daylor said, there's no such thing as a future fact. And there's no such thing as a past possibility either. So how might you study uh, something in a future that does not exist yet? And that's where the tricky part comes in and the design and the co-creation and collaboration. You have to figure out together as a consultant and at the same time as a person who's really pushing foresight at, at, the, at the institutional level. And then uh, another insight that I learned is that uh, beyond uh, data, beyond evidence is of course uh, solutioning, right? So you just don't do scenario for the sake of it. You just don't do scenario planning for the sake of the report that you need to like some sort of give to higher ups. Okay, you know, uh, it's, it's hype, it's hip, let's do scenarios. But then at the end of the day, you know, if you talk to CEOs, uh, state university presidents, mayors, governors, you know, senators, it's always almost about Monday morning strategies, right? So how might you be able to link you know, the vision uh, to the Monday morning questions, uh, policies, programs, and strategies. Like for example, you're faced with a problem on African swine flu and it's impacting the economy right now. And then you come in as a futurist, you know, what are you gonna give them, right? So, uh, and then the third thing is that of course, uh, they're beyond, beyond uh, government, uh, and uh, of course, I think more, uh, uh, beyond government is the public sector space, right? That is where foresight becomes even more complicated beyond the institution, beyond the traditional institutions, beyond uh, uh, the, now I wouldn't say the, the elite, but those who have access to political power and the governance authority are 
are the other sectors like the social civic, you know, the societal, you know, the communities, the people organizations, the designers, right? The inventors and innovators, you know, they're they're not really interested about data because what they have in mind is to challenge the data. And, and second is not really about solutioning, but creating an alternative future world. So how might you design something that enables them to venture into the unknown, you know, and unpack, discover some insight that leads to new types of innovation. And last but not the least, of course, are the people, right? You, you don't communicate foresight for the sake of it. You don't communicate the, the narrative as it is, as futurists would love to like write it, you know, for, 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 for the field, you know, for practitioners, but uh, it has to have some sort of a message. It has to mean to a lot of people, right? Uh, you know, how might you, you know, uh, invite people like uh, an ordinary individual or a community or a village who is a part of a, a wider, uh, larger economic system and engage themselves, you know, into a practice of, of foresight. Uh, that's where uh, stories come in, right? Like, you know, how might we enable ourselves to change the story that we tell ourselves by using futures and foresight as uh, a method or a platform? But then, of course, again, you know, there's another conversation going on among futurists. You know, we've said that, you know, uh, perhaps futures and foresight, we need to push the boundaries. Like, uh, we, we, we don't want to end up disowning ourselves as what Homer have said, that excellence is our fatal flaw. You know, can futures and foresight practitioner push the boundaries and go beyond the method, the tools, and just facilitate, you know, ignite a conversation that engages people to treasure, you know, and empower and enable them to shape their own future. So, uh, yes, uh, that's for me, Cheryl. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. I think it's such a, a um, wonderful um, to hear. I think these themes of, of you know, foresight also potentially being a container, right? And, and uh, a way of being inclusive and bringing together uh, diverse opinions. And, and um, I think that that's, that's a very interesting role, especially when we're talking about building this kind of capacity for this, this public service. And uh, Eva, Aura, and you Sherman have um, touched on this in various ways, right? You know, whether it's a participatory capacity or bringing together different skill sets, EQ, active listening, um, you know, uh, and, and I think it's such an such a important uh, kind of next generation skill, right? That goes beyond actually just the narrow defines of what futures tools uh, might be. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll pose a question that's come in on the Q&A uh, for all the panelists. So there've been, uh, I think some questions around uh, what happens if you are building this capacity from scratch? And I think um, all three of you have had this experience in some shape or form, uh, but any practical starting points, you know, if you're looking at building futures capacity from scratch, uh, you know, what are one or two tips you might be able to give uh, our audience today? Uh, maybe we can go backwards. We can start with Sherman and then Aura and Eva, if that's okay. Yeah, you know, re reflecting on what I learned over the years is that you cannot just go straight out to a scenario development workshop exercise because people would end up just imagining the default or use feature. Like even if you engage them for two to three days, learn the tools, but then imagination is not being questioned. The way we know about the future are not being questioned. You know, the basic things that inform futures and foresight imagining are our assumptions, right? So uh, I would say if you want to build from the scratches that you have to start with features literacy. You know, uh, futures literacy. Of course, we all know this uh, that UNESCO has to design uh, a, a project, you know, over several years, you know, to democratize access to futures thinking. That this is not just not no longer about you know scoping what are the requirements of consultants, of decision makers, and the elites, but uh, enabling and empowering them to realize that actually futures and foresight is an active aspect of the present. That it is a capacity that we all have. It might be dormant for some, for others. It could be mature for others. But the futures literacy in the context of capability and as a skill set to use the future as an asset, a tool and resource is very critical. So people would need, must you know spend time learning about futures you know, what is futures, you know, how might you connect yourself, your personal futures with a wider vision about the world? Because when it enters the public domain, especially in the government, things gets really complicated, right? So, but then if uh, people know, you know, uh, 
if they have the capacity and they skill set and they are conscious on how they do futures, I think it becomes empowering. So I think literacy is very critical and crucial. Even before the tools and the methods, they have to learn not just the concept, they have to experience it, right? And uh, develop, make, making them aware that it's not just a concept, it is a skill set that we need in the 21st century. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, Oras? Yes, so to build on from what Sherman uh, said uh, from Futures Literacy, uh, from my own experience in designing our workshops when we do training, we always start from yourself. You know? So we would do imagination of yourself now in terms of metaphorically, you know, if you were a fruit or if you were an animal or if you were something, you know, what would you be, right? And then metaphorically think about yourself in the future of where you like to be. And so I've seen, the, you know, one of my colleagues said she's a 7-Eleven right now, like nonstop, always on, lights on, in, out, anybody can come in, you know, to her life. She doesn't want to be a 7-Eleven anymore. She wants to be like a small, uh, cute boutique shop that opens from, you know, nine to four, and then the rest have her time and lights would be off, things like that, which reflects how she wants to continue living in a way that is mindful and that can control her time, for instance. So we, I, I would start with things like this because, why? Because you, you were then forced to observe yourself first before you go and observe others and things out there in the world, you know? And then with that, the connection, the vulnerability that you're able to show to yourself and then to your teammate or the, the workshop uh, uh, that you're in. And then that really opens up, again, I'm gonna repeat what I call the safe space. So when the safe space is opened up, and that's when we can start talking about, okay, tough stuff, right? Future of marriage. Come on, let it be same sex. And then some people will be, whoa, you know? Or come on, Singapore, maybe it's not like this. What if Singapore, no PAP, what to do? You know, the tough stuff then will, will be easier to digest, I think. Um, so starting with yourself is my advice. Fantastic, Eva? So I, I mean, I agree with uh, Shaman and uh, aura <clears throat> and assuming that you've started with yourself and you've uh, you know focused on future literacy maybe attended a few of the sessions that Cheryl has run at the LKYSVP program and you're going back to your public service and now you're thinking about how do I you know uh, build this capability across the public service and do the work not just have learned about it um, I mean I, I, I'm not an expert but uh, I was involved in our early policy gaming development uh, um, efforts. And I think one of the things that I think has been helpful is actually starting small and finding some really great use cases. So are there certain projects that you can start that where you can demonstrate the um, benefits uh, of, of uh, futures work and how it can advance the agendas of uh, some of your key stakeholders that you know, you're interested in help, uh, helping them understand that this is actually a capability that the organization or public service should invest in. Um, I think that's the first is do the good work, prove that there is a benefit in the work. Uh, and then there's a lot of PR, like almost, right? Marketing, sharing, and uh, really, you know, not being um, too shy to share. This is really useful. This is what we've done. And this is the impact that has created, the potential impact that it cre can create. I think that's the only way I think people see can see value in the work that you do beyond just a theoretical concept that you're bringing back, but they've not actually seen what it can actually do. So, so that would be some of my ideas on how to grow that capability. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, definitely, I think it's, it's uh, yeah, to start small. I, we're in startup phase two at the Lee Kuan Yew School and this uh, start, start small, early wins, uh, you know, think like entrepreneur. <laughs> definitely is, is really the, the, the way to go. And I think some of it's very counterintuitive actually in terms of building capacity, especially in bureaucracies. Um, but it's not just futures capacity, right? It's any other capacity, you know? It's, it's you're not gonna be the world leading expert tomorrow, you know? So, so what is the way, what's that journey? Uh, really interesting. Um, I, I think I want you to, to also again address another question that would come in in the chat. Um, and, and this theme has come up a lot, right? So whether it's inequality or, or um, again, you know, this who owns the future, how do we create this safe space to have conversations that are, are more inclusive and quite, quite difficult in many ways. 
um, you know, so the question is around, you know, in a world that's growing in poverty and inequality, how can foresight be of any help to address this inequality? And maybe I'll give you a little bit of context um, to uh, given some of the conversations that we had at the Lee Kuan Yew School. And there's one question that we get asked a lot uh, is that is futures or foresight only a developed country kind of capacity, right? And our worldview is that it is not. You know, um, and and there are and just because developed countries use it in a certain way, it doesn't mean that there aren't other ways and other expressions of how it can be useful. Then, the, so then the more important question is, you know, then how do we understand, right? Under what conditions, uh, futures tools, uh, you know, can be can be relevant, and and how do we make it relevant in our own context? Um, so I'd be curious to also hear from everybody, um, you know, uh, about. The use of foresight and, and, and kind of making it more inclusive, right? Uh, addressing inequality questions, which are uh, perhaps only going to be exacerbated by COVID. Maybe let's go Aura and then. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, I think um, actually, I think foresight techniques is suitable for all, you know, for all, all ages, <laughs> all genders, all countries. Um, specifically for me, because it relies less on text, um, the idea again of talking in metaphors, using images, uh, expressing oneself uh, in such a way that's not restricted to the formalities of bureaucratic language and so on. So I really think foresight is suitable for all um, in the world. And I think that it can potentially, of course, bring us to the heart of inequality because, um, for example, the causal layer analysis, you know, why do we see homeless people in the city? Where are they? Why, did, why are they there? You know, and then you start thinking about the systems, the structures, the worldviews, uh, the, the beliefs that we have about having a home and who's supposed to pay for the home and what's in the home, you know, and how, how, how much should a home be? All these things then feed into our better a better understanding, I think, of what it means to be poor or not poor. What is poverty? And then the inequalities that we design, that we define is is it truly inequality that that we think you know we, we want to talk about? Again, all these things because it goes right into the heart of questioning the discourse, the narratives. Uh, I, I I really think it's it's very useful for inequality. Um, or discuss, dissecting and reconstructing even the problem of inequality. Yeah. Fantastic. Maybe Sherman and then Eva. Yeah, uh, that that's a good point. You know, as Horeb said, that was that is actually what I had in mind. That when we talk about larger issues like poverty or the sustainable development goals, you know, the emphasis really that you need to accentuate are the systemic and structural causes of this problem, like uh, poverty or hunger or uh, malnutrition, you know, that's where, you know, a governance discourse uh, come in. But how might you be able to like some sort of facilitate the conversation at all levels, you know, from the national government level to scholars, to experts and policymakers is, is another thing, you know, uh, as far as features practitioners is concerned, that is a real challenge. And the, what we did, you know, we've acknowledged that in fact, uh, four of us, you know, at the Philippine Futures Thinking Society enrolled at the Lee Kuan Yew School, uh, this, this, school you know the executive education course so I encourage everyone to sign up and that it gave us you know the ability and the time the space to actually figure out you know the approach mm. right so what are the things that what are the drivers of change that we need to consider as a futures uh, as a futures movement you know to influence uh, policy discourse in effect you know government targets uh, policy priorities you know uh, programs budget uh, particularly is that what we learned is that there are two things that you need to have you know, as from, from, from a Philippine context. One is the political. Of course, you know, uh, 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 governance issues and policy issues are, is, is an exchange, a debate about a political narratives, right? Like uh, somebody wins, somebody loses, but we still we need to create some solutions that you know, everybody hopefully wins uh, in the end. Not, 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 not everyone might win, but then of course the narrative that you need to use, you know, to influence decision makers should be there. So political access is very critical and crucial. So how might the futures of foresight, developing futures capabilities, look like if you have political access 
or if you do not, if you have a direct political access, or if you have an indirect political access, how might you drive future scale capacity within the bureaucracy or outside the bureaucracy? And then, of course, another thing that we learned in that exercise is that the social civic engagement. So it's not, of course, you know, government governance is politics, governance is influence. It's all about democracy, right? Like enabling pe people to have a voice, you know, in the policy discourse is that you also have the social civic sector, which is the larger, larger uh, community when we talked about governance, because, you know, government is about them, right? It's for the people. So we have to figure out how might we be able to engage the social civic sector in the way we shape uh, define or change our assumptions about particular problems like poverty. So uh, futures in foresight is, is a long journey. <laughs> if we prepared ourselves that, hey, we're gonna do this, we have to remember that this is futures in foresight. The agenda is long-term. You know, issues like poverty are long-term, these are intergenerational, but you have to do something today, you know, to, uh, you know, you have to like do the fight, figure out, you know, what are the, the decisions that decision makers need to do today in order for them to create a more positive impact when, when changing, you know, uh, the, the figures as far as poverty is concerned. It's a complex world out there, but uh, we, we have to be humble. And then that's why uh, networking is very, very critical and crucial, especially in developing future capabilities, capacities, you know. Uh, not, no, we don't have a big number of futurists or foresight practitioners out there. These are public issues. So networking is very critical. And I think what I also learned just quickly is that, you know, futurists need not have to really like, you know, be the one talking in the public policy domain. Partner with an expert, a scientist who's really good on that particular issue, you know, train them, uh, uh, work with them in terms of tools and methods. And these are the people in authority who can speak out about the relevance of futures when it comes to a particular policy issue. Fantastic. That's such a, definitely such wise, wise advice. Um, I'm going to change the question slightly for you, uh, Eva. Um, I think there'll be quite a lot of questions on the participatory foresight uh, part, right? And I, and I think that this is also one way of having these kind of uh, difficult conversations or using futures to talk about, you know, these complex, uh, you know, kind of uh, social issues as well. Um, you know, so so one question that was that came in for you on the Q and A was, how has your experience been engaging in participatory for, uh, foresight projects? Um, you know, and how what was the reaction actually of um, you know the public when you engaged them, assuming that they had no no knowledge, uh, you know, prior knowledge of the field? Um, and we had a related question from somebody who's based in India, um, is that is. You know, of course, Singapore is a very tiny country uh, in comparison, uh, you know, so, so um, any insights, you know, for translating this work uh, from the Singapore context, uh, maybe to, to a place like India? It's a hard so, question, so I know. <laughs> we'll start with that one first, I think, because it, I think it was useful for me, I think, to just remember that while I use the word national effort, right, national participatory foresight activities, national in our context might be city level for in some of your countries so i think that is uh, useful just just to uh I, even for me, right, to forget that uh, the scale of Singapore versus the other cities, and and I I don't think it, and so we were fortunate to be able to do something at the national level, uh, but I think that that is something that at the city level. Um, or even as Sherman said, in a small community can be very powerful as well. And I think we learned that when we did the first uh, Our Singapore Conversation, I mean, Cheryl might remember that when we embarked on it, and, and, and um, I think in all instances, we had a political will behind it, right? It wasn't just a public service driven uh, initiative, it was uh, politically backed um, and, and, and it was nationwide. And I think there was some concern, like, oh, we've never done this before. Will be, will we be opening a Pandora's box? Uh, you know, in raising expectations across the country about what the future holds and whether we can deliver, um, you know, uh, the the kinds of policies, uh, programs that that uh, citizens might be hoping for. But I think what we've learned is actually it was the kind of the reaction was like, well, nobody's asked us before. And it's great that somebody <laughs> wants to hear what we have to say and what we think. Because Sherman started his, uh, you know, sharing, talking about how uh, futures work needs to be data driven. And actually, 
uh, our communities can provide us with a lot of data and very quickly. And I think we found that with the Emerging Stronger conversations, rather than having some research done back end in the office, actually talking to people actually helped us crowdsource for what are the issues, the challenges that different people are facing, what were some um, you know, early signals that they were seeing or uh, that uh, we might not have noticed from different sectors of the, the community that it's really important for us as futurists to, to consider. Um, and so I think it was, our experience was just that people wanted to share, they have experiences and they want, and, and um, it was good for them to feel like somebody cared and, and were willing to listen. Um, and I think as we have journeyed in this, um, in this, uh, you know, experience with participatory foresight and these activities, we've also realized that there's education that goes on as we dialogue and as we engage, right? That the citizens are understanding that, oh, okay, so this ex exercise in the first instance helped, you know, uh, un the, the policymakers or government, government understand a few things, and this next exercise is about this, and the next exercise about something else. So I think one of the things that I did want to clarify, and I saw one of the questions was, do you, do you need an educated citizenry? Just to clarify, what I'm not advocating is for you to bring a group of citizens and I'm going to and tell them I'm going to teach you how to do causal layer analysis. I will teach you how to do backcasting. Let's do it together. It's not. It's just about facilitating that conversation. And Aura was saying they had, you know, uh, her school had come up with um, discussion cards, foresight cards. Was so it Aura you mentioned earlier in our conversation? And in Singapore, we have uh, developed that too, that any citizen can take. And in a family conversation, you know, let shall we like look at these deck of cards and ask ourselves these questions and have a discussion about um, the impact of uh, aging population on uh, the future, right, for Singapore. So I think it's more about thinking creatively about how to have the conversations so that you are getting useful data that can inform the future's work rather than you know, expecting the citizen to do the futures and foresight work. Uh, yeah, so that, that nuance I thought was uh, worth kind of explaining. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you so much. I'm curious to, I mean, we all come from different, um, we're all educators in different ways, right? But I, I do have a question for everyone around, where do you think foresight should be introduced uh, you know, so there's some some there's one school of thought that says actually, you know, why why don't we teach it in uh, primary school, right? Um, at the Lee Kuan Yew School, we're partnering with uh, one of our local junior colleges to introduce futures work in a I think ten or twelve week curriculum. You know, we do youth competitions. Of course, we teach it in a graduate school executives that kind of thing. So where's the right level of intervention? Does anybody have a have a, a sense or? Yeah, uh, if I may go first, uh, Cheryl, yes. quickly. Yes, you know, uh, uh, this is an insight that we learned over uh, several months at the Philippine Futures Thinking Society is that the approach that we learned that works best for us is the societal approach, right? Societal approach to futures literacy, to democratizing uh, futures thinking. Uh, and I would just want like to uh, uh, accentuate what Eva said that political will is very critical when you talked about high level penetration of futures thinking and foresight and application at the policy level. You need to have a champion, <laughs> right? Because it's, 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 you, you can actually leapfrog if you have a strong champion at high, high level policy makers. Like in the Philippines, we're fortunate that we have a champion. Uh, Senator Pia Cayetano is currently the chair of the Committee on SDGs, Innovation and Futures Thinking. She's really been into it in the last eight months, and uh, 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 you know the committee was able to you know convince the Senate and the Republic to budget you know uh, put money into foresight and uh, you know for national government agencies for state universities. So there are a lot of things going on you know because of that initiative, and 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 uh, second of course uh, this is what we learned that it has to be some sort of a rice cake approach, right? You know warm it from the top and then you have to heat it from below. So the social <laughs> civic approach is very critical and crucial because the end users, you know, at the end of the day are, are the people, the public, right? It's the community that defines, you know, it's your metric indicator whether you're getting the, you're achieving the targets or not. Without their engagement, policies are useless. So, you know, both, you know, at the same time, if you could do it, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> 
I think if nobody remembers anything from this webinar, please remember <laughs> that Futures is a rice cake approach. You must warm it from the top and heat it from the bottom. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> I, I just want to, I think, jump in. And I'm just reading, I just uh, saw the chat and then Elijah had said the subject is the same, the levels of introduction um, and the discussion can be different. And I think that's a, a very wise kind of point. Because I'm thinking that when I was in uh, elementary school, right, I remember doing an art project about the future. And I remember drawing, you know, like uh, flying cars and things like that. And I think that's something that we do all over the world, right? And so I, I think that there's, it's never too early to, to talk about the future. But again, as Elijah said, uh, the subject might be the same, but the level of introduction um, and what we're introducing into the voc vocabulary of the, of the community that we're looking at, whether it's uh, an elementary school student or a high school student might, might differ. Um, but I think that um, today in this uh, post-pandemic world, I think we have such a great opportunity to be talking about the future because it's um, penetrating everybody, every individual, every society is affected by this. Um, and so I think it's a really great inflection point for us to really think about uh, having that conversation with uh, our younger, uh, at, at younger levels and generations. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Or did you have a comment for? I actually have a, a slightly uh, different comment from, instead of saying at which level, um, my question would be, is it suitable for authoritarian states as well? You know, um, uh, Sherman spoke a lot about the, uh, democracy and, and all that. So I was just thinking that, um, you know, the idea of critical thinking, design thinking and, and foresight, actually, does it truly require a very open, liberal, democratic space, you know, to be completely innovative and everybody could do what they want and of course have some sort of um, cohesion of course I mean does it because I'm I we we started talking about the um, kind of a elite-led foresight you know and, and how do we turn make sure that it's not a technical process that you know only understood to be only some people can do it and you need to be certified or you know, I'm, I'm saying all this is because I'm starting to see some patterns of, uh, have you done foresight? You know, it's like beyond SWAT, have you done foresight? <laughs> what, what were your driving forces? You know, or what were your, where's your scenarios? You know, <laughs> um, And I, I try to repeat, at least here in Thailand, that, hey, let's never put it as a technical uh, step for bureaucrats to do, because without truly embracing it, you know, then it just becomes another check, checklist, right? Uh, and then it serves doesn't serve any purpose. So just wanted to to throw that in. Okay. Fantastic, and I think it's uh, such an interesting. I mean, we've, we've touched on this. Uh, so so one question that we get asked a lot as well in the school is this kind of idea of objectivity of the foresight process, right? And of course, you know, even though we talk about it as a safe space, as a container. Uh, it can also be subject to, uh, you know, kind of biases and, and different agendas and, you know, um, so I think that that's a particularly interesting question for, for those of us who are developing this uh, skill within a public service, right, within the bureaucracy. So, um, you know, one of the questions has been, been really around, uh, you know, do you see futures thinking as being separate from the, the political uh, interventions and for me, the more important question then is what do we focus on as those of us who are intervening in the civil service, public service side of the house? Any thoughts? Um, I Maybe I'll just drop me. I might have been the one who started the political, <laughs> political <laughs> angle to this. And I think just to clarify uh, was that I think a uh, futures uh, activity, for, you know, foresight activity at the national level in Singapore, I, I, you know, it, in that uh, scenario, you might you might see that uh, political support uh, and will is is important, but I don't think that it it, it must come with political for, like you know, uh, futures work must uh, must necessarily be accompanied with political will. I think that. You can do futures work uh, at the national level. It can be at an organizational or department level, depending on the work that you're doing. And I, I think there is space for us to be as 
uh, public service practitioners using the tools to actually improve the way we are thinking about the work that we do and preparing ourselves for potential uh, futures, right? And um, uh, and thinking ahead and, and, and being agile and anticipatory and all that. Last. So that was just my two cents on, on this topic. I'm not sure whether the other speakers uh, feel the same way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say is that it depends on the person, you know, asking for it, you know, because uh, or the agency or the organization who's interested in futures in foresight, you know, uh, this institution defines the scope, right? In, in each and every foresight futures activity that we do, or whether you are a resource person or a consultant or a teacher or, or an academic is that it, it depends on the intent, right? Like why were you invited in the first place, right? If they're gonna invite you for a policy making committee hearing conversation about the future of cities and transport of mobility, you're talking about uh, uh, elected officials here, right? So there is a strong political angle you know, in, in the way they do things, right? But then you come in there, uh, not as someone who pushes some somebody's agenda, but you are there as a futurist, you know, to like just present to them that, you know, uh, our, you know, we, we should start questioning our assumptions, right? So uh, reframe, you know, if we could find ways to do that, then uh, perhaps it could lead to different types of uh, solutioning or, or policy. But definitely at the, at, at the policy government level, uh, that is an angle that you will, you're will you always faced with. Uh, but then if you are invited by a company in the corporation, of course, this is always almost always about the priorities of your CEO, you know, or uh, informed by the strategic plan that they have, because that's the budget that they you know, they provided to do futures and foresight. But uh, bottom line is, is that uh, regardless, you know, whether that is a government societal institution, wh whoever actors or stakeholders that might, uh, that are, are, are engaged into the futures and foresight practice that as a futurist or a foresight practitioner or facilitators that you have to ensure that everyone has a voice, that everybody acknowledge that uh, at the end of the day, or perhaps not at the end of the day, this is how futures and foresight really work is that, uh, you know, uh, it could emerge to different types of pluralities. You know? And even within that pluralism is heterogeneity, you know, uh, that we start accepting, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, as uh, Cheryl has said that, you know, we have to be upfront with our biases because if people are clear about the biases that they have, it could also be enabling and empowering. Fantastic, thank you so much. Well, if I could uh, add, I think, um, you know, the, the idea is, the best scenario is to have, uh, you know, the traditional, the not traditional, but the mainstream people saying, okay, this small group, go do foresight, you know, and come back and, and share with us. You have all the freedom. Um, and I, I think that's the best, one of the best scenarios. But I do agree with Eva that um, some topics, we might not need to have anyone. If we can, if we feel strongly about something, just you know, get up and do do foresight on it, you know, and gather people who are willing to come together, you know, um, without needing to have someone uh, hire people to do foresight. That's what I mean. But just to share with you openly, you know, with Chiang Mai University, one of the scenarios that we came up with that everyone's fired, you know, and all the faculties are abolished and the university is left with only the president and the IT manager because everything can be done online and it will be based on contract and the students will do DIY, you know, design yourself curriculum all the time. So, so such scenarios is very scary and I don't think um, people feel e easy to listen to that, but without putting it again onto the table, then it's hard to, to be future ready. Yeah, it's definitely true. And I think in, in, its, in its ideal kind of uh, manifestation, futures can be a very useful tool to speak the unspeakable and think the unthinkable, right? That we enter into a safe space that we understand that this is what the conversation that we're going to have. Um, and to be able to set aside that safe space, I do feel it's an organizational discipline. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and and that's that's also very interesting in terms of you know how do you as organizations like build in these habits, you know, to create these safe spaces because they don't naturally occur on their own. Um, and maybe talking a little bit about organizational habits, we've got uh, a, a bunch of questions that are all clustered around the idea of kind of different uh, different time scales, 
right? So for example, uh, one might be that you can do futures work, but then the legislative process takes very long, right? Um, you know, or if you, you know, oper uh, if, if public service delivery, the demands on public service delivery is constantly changing, you know, but then and then at the grassroots level, uh, but then how do you future proof, you know, the policy, you know, which maybe takes a little bit longer. Um, any thoughts on how do we, you know, kind of balance these tensions, right, which I think are so inherent in, in this, kind, this kind of work, um, and especially as developing these capacities within a public service, uh, you know, any, any ideas um, or reflections on how, how, what's the best way to balance these different time scales and different pressures that are on us? Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me just quickly give uh, what, what my thoughts on that. Is that uh, you know that's a, a really good question, and uh, we might not even see the end of that, right? Like if while you do futures and foresight, these issues are long term, right? Uh, what I would say is that uh, of course uh, futures capacity. You have foresight practitioner, futurist, and or people driving the futures, uh, you know, program within an organization. Then you have several people who are involved in 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 in, in into that phase is I think what is really, really essential that puts checks and balance into the practice and ethics and outcome of what we do is the process that we, we, we design you know, for, for this institution that we are a part of. Like, uh, for example, for me in the Philippines, you know, that there has been, there's been a strong buy-in uh, because there has been a lot of push, you know, uh, from, from the national government level. And of course, the scope is, right, you know, uh, set up futures program, try to figure out how, you know, how you, you will be able to make sense and integrate this embedded, embedded into your organizational structure, your day-to-day -day operations, blah, 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 try to figure that out. But uh, what, what I would say is that, you know, the ethics of the person who's driving the futures and foresight you know, program within the organization has to be there. You know, that is something that also the Association of Professional Futurists has uh, had, 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 have had conversation in the last several months, because after the pandemic, there were only a few numbers of futurists on LinkedIn. But after the pandemic, you now have like a based on our uh, scope, you know, research is that there are like around 26,000, you know, who claims that they are a professional futurist practitioners. Right, that that is a, a the issue <laughs> in itself, right? So uh, that that is a question for another time, perhaps. But uh, as far as organization and institution are concerned, you know the process is very crucial. If it would take like around twelve months to eight months, so be it, right? You just don't do it for the sake of it, in order for them to have to submit reports, you know, for for the governments, you know, or for the authorities who require them to set up their futures thinking and foresight program. It ha it, it has to be uh, it, two things. You know, process is very critical and crucial you know to 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 ensure the cap capability that 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 goes in really work and the thinking that we put into the foresight process and of course we are measured by impact right like what does this lead to does it lead to new ideas uh, new strategies new innovation new ways of uh, budgeting and uh, new ways of, of thinking reframing policies blah 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 yeah i'm sorry about the blah 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 <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it's also an innovative capacity of a public service, right? I mean, you can throw out all the wonderful ideas, you know, and if there's no ability to absorb them, uh, you know, th that there's also a limitation to how much futures can do. Uh, but I'm curious to hear from either Eva or uh, Aura. So, like, I, I can, I mean, I, I can empathize on the frustration uh, that futurists might feel, right? Having had done the work and then. The delays or, or that but i feel like if your reality is already some of this bureauc bureaucracy slowness uh, uh, you know i think it's still better that you've done the futures work and the foresight work and that's informed the the policies that you're designing the programs um uh, and and then have to deal with the slowness rather than not having done that work before because i do really believe that it actually helps us understand the the issues that we're grappling with, uh, some of the key driving forces, um, and 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 help us better influence, I think, uh, possibilities. I but I also think that uh, so I agree with Sherman also that actually the for me the richness of foresight work is also in the engagement, right? In the help in the conversations that we have, not just that the programs and uh, plans that that emerge from it, because even if you're a government working very fast. Uh, the cycle of change is so quick now that uh, I don't know if we can keep up with it, but I think the fact that we're having conversations around 
uh, some of the trends that we're seeing and what it might mean for us, I think helps uh, society, I think, uh, be more agile and adaptable and, and be more resilient, right, to the change that, that uh, might be uh, before us. Now, I just wanted to make another point, though, also around the fact that, um, you know, I, uh, the, you know, futures work is not just in the domain of the public uh, sector, right? So we are seeing a lot of civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations also partaking in futures and foresight work. And I think it makes the system stronger that, uh, you know, that it's not just the public service thinking about the futures, but there's, you know, different points of view and, 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 and everybody's thinking about issues differently or in a different way. It doesn't have to be like one giant exercise, right? And I, but I think collectively, if we're all thinking about it, like really studying the trends and looking at what the data is telling us, I think we, and I, maybe I'm an optimist in this regard, but I think we are just stronger uh, together as a result uh, of this. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Fantastic. Aura? Oh yeah, no, I want to um, echo what Eva and Sherman already said. I, I want to focus on the word transformational, you know? So doing futures work is transformational at the individual level, right? Because we get different lens to see the world and to analyze the problems and possibilities of the future. So even if um, tomorrow or next week, the government doesn't take up that agenda, but at least that particular person has been transformed, right? So the more we do of this, then at least we get more people to see the world uh, with a different lens. So I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. Fantastic. I, um, we are coming towards the end of the time that we have allocated for the, the webinar, uh, but I'm going to take moder moderator's privilege uh, and ask the last question of all of you. Um, so we've spent a lot of time talking about building futures capacity for organizations and governments and it's all, you know, our universities and it's all very big and lofty. Um, but I'm curious as how do you build futures capacity for yourself, actually? Um, you know, and if you could share maybe one or two tips with your audience of, of how that's that oh, your own journey in building that capacity has been like. And specifically, if you could share maybe the last uh, book, podcast, you know, documentary, uh, you know, the last thing you read, watched, listened to, um, you know, that's kind of influence your, your thinking about the future. Um, we really love uh, to add on to our book recommendations. Uh, you know, a list that we're really wonderful to hear from you. Um, maybe we can do uh, Eva, Aura, and Sherman, just to go back to our original. <laughs> okay, uh, I love that question. Um, well, I think, uh, well, this uh, discussion has been very informative. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, reaching out to fellow futurists is a really good way of, uh, I think, keeping fresh and up to date uh, on, I think, some of the uh, thinking around futures. But in terms of the last book, uh, so I've just downloaded uh, on our library app, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro's uh, new book, Clara and the Sun, and I'm hoping to dig into uh, this weekend. But I recently read uh, Grasp, The um, Science of Learning, if I'm not wrong, um, that's written, uh, that is written by uh, Sanjay uh, Sarma, who is MIT's Vice President uh, of Open Learning. Uh, so it's called Grass, the Science, Transforming How We Learn. I think really a useful um, discussion, a very uh, neuroscience uh, approach. Uh, I think because he's in MIT and he has the luxury of all these colleagues to, the, you know, to his left and to the right, informing his thinking around uh, the neuroscience of learning, and uh, which is very relevant, I think, today with uh, how we are changing the way we are learning from in-person uh, to a lot more virtual open universities and things like that. So that's uh, something I recently read. I, I highly recommend it. It is a really great and accessible read. Hey, thanks so much. Aura? Okay, so for me, I have a PhD student who's working on future studies. And We've been going over debates that involve, you know, um, critical theory and critical realism in future studies. And actually where, well, she, my student, is um, interested to see all the approaches that, have, that are being used around the world today and which ones are more positivist, uh, post-positivist, which ones are more critical, 
and which one are more critical realists. So these are kind of the debates that's going on uh, with between me and my PhD student. Anyone who would like to jump into such conversations <laughs> is also welcome. Uh, so she's taking you know, a, a step back to really look at. So the kinds of readings that uh, I'm kind of following my own students' work would be in the journals that talk about uh, critical realism and future studies. I also follow, of course, um, Sohail Inayatullah's uh, Facebook and his work every day, <laughs> not every day, but you know, when he puts things up. Uh, so those would be sort of my two, not, I don't have specific books to recommend, <laughs> but I guess uh, sharing more of the concepts that I'm looking at and then uh, the guru that I'm following. Also, we're, we're trying to work with John Sweeney, who's another futurist that would, would, might, might come into this region in the near future to work uh, for, for, for those who are interested to collaborate, yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Cheryl. You know, uh, and, and exactly. You know, I, I have this book now. Two weeks ago, started reading it. You know, my question was like, how might I, how might I be able to like some sort of design a futures and a foresight process that's more effective and impactful and powerful in in a complex system like public institutions, right? You know, uh, that enables me to navigate you know, ways uh, like, for example, change of command are always there, right? And then you have always have bureaucratic bottlenecks, you know, how might you draw them in into a conversation of futures and foresight and then uh, achieve uh, a, 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 an end, you know, or an end game wherein you develop uh, the, uh, some sort of uh, mutual accountability, uh, mutual trust, you know, and, and those kinds of stuff at the end of a futures and foresight work. And then luckily I was able to get bought by this book. It says leading without authority. You know, how might you be able to design a futures and foresight work that enables people, you know, to, uh, that enables everyone who's involved, you know, to accentuate the power of co-elevation, breaking down silos and transforming teams and reinventing collaboration. I think that's, uh, you know, how might you lead without authority you know, in the futures context? So, yeah. Good book. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. And thank you so much to our three wonderful panelists for this fantastic conversation. Uh, we did manage to get through everybody's questions, but do appreciate also it's given us a lot of food for thought, uh, you know, and, and uh, also helped us, you know, kind of shape our conversation as, as we've gone along. Um, if the audience is willing to indulge me, may I ask that everybody um, type in maybe one insight or takeaway that you've had from this conversation, maybe as an ex expression of gratitude also to our panelists uh, for the time that they've spent uh, with us. That would be fantastic. Uh, my colleagues have just put up uh, a QR code uh, that's for feedback. Uh, from this webinar, as I mentioned right at the start, that we are doing this as a series. So definitely, uh, and we're at a kind of the early stages. So uh, your feedback would be very valuable uh, to us um, so that we can continue to host conversations like this. Um, I think that's one of the roles of a university, I think, <laughs> you know, to make, uh, to create knowledge and make it public. So, so we do hope that you'll be part of uh, the conversation as well. Can I have the next slide if everybody's gotten the uh, QR code? Um, so we do have a next episode <laughs> coming up. We're trying to do this every two months. Um, so the next episode is going to be in June uh, and we'll talk a little bit about developing the next generation of futurists. Uh, a little bit more, um, uh, so we are we're doing a youth competition and actually a number of uh, young, uh, futures for young, younger people <laughs> uh, activities in June. So uh, hoping to have that conversation uh, uh, at the end of June. So if you can join us, uh, you know, you keep a lookout for, for the mailing list and so on. Uh, one more slide. Uh, executive education, we're always running programs. Uh, please connect with us, uh, you know, on the website and so on. If you're interested in any of our upcoming open enrollment programs, uh, a lot of our stuff is now online. Uh, you know, so also welcome people who are not based in Singapore uh, to attend as well. And I think that's the last one. Keep in touch with us. So uh, we are constantly, we're ramping up our futures capacity. So really excited to host more of these conversations and so on if you're really interested. Uh, if you've enjoyed this one, uh, you know, do, do encourage you to keep, keep in touch 
uh, by connecting with uh, Executive Education on LinkedIn, um, you know, or, or dropping us an email for future collaborations. And if that's, uh, I think that's all from that I have. Um, I just wanted to say again, thank you very much to our wonderful uh, panel, Eva, Aura, and Sherman. I think it's such a, a, a gift, you know, that you've given us of your time, but also of your, your years of experience. You know, I think that that's what I, I took away from the conversation, um, that it's not just futures thinking in a purely academic sense, it's also <laughs> trying to make it work in the real world, which is another level of uh, complexity and and the uh, challenge, right? But never, nevertheless, we will persist. Uh, and uh, as Sherman has suggested, we must warm it from the top and <laughs> eat it from the bottom. And somebody in the chat said, must fan it from the side also. <laughs> so, so I do uh, wish you everybody uh, a good evening, morning, night, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you very much. I would love time. to see the, the image of the rice cake though, because I think in our respective uh, yes. cultures, <laughs> the rice cake looks different, but definitely the yeah, same yeah. way to cook. <laughs> exactly, I think we need t-shirts. <laughs> like, rice like, cake. I feel like we need rice cake t-shirts. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we, we, we're we hoping to also get a better understanding of what futures and public policy looks like in Asia, you know, so I think that to me is just such a wonderful uh, uh, imagery, right? <laughs> very specific to our context. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, really, really um, uh, delighted to see so many of you here. And thank you again to our panelists. Uh, and uh, thank you from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Mm -hmm.